I'm going to introduce Charles Van Sullen, who will do the interview, uh, the introduction of, uh, of, uh, of Larry. Uh, Larry was a very close friend of General's, and he was a frequent lecturer here at the school, and an annual lecturer, or biannual lecturer, or triannual lecturer in General Yaiko's classes for uh, many, many years. And uh, without any further ado, this is Charles Van Sullen, who's also a good friend of uh, General Yaiko's who will introduce uh, Larry. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, such an excellent turnout. Thank you very much, Dr. Tierney. Uh, I'd like to add my words of welcome to his. If this is your first time at the Institute of World Politics, thank you very much for coming. The Institute of World Politics is a graduate school in national security and international affairs dedicated to developing leaders with a sound understanding of international realities and uh, the ethical conduct of statecraft. This event this afternoon is an open class session in our course, Military Strategy and Overview of the Theorists of Warfare. Because this is an open class session, our uh, enrolled students have the uh, first right of questioning and will guide the discussion later on. Uh, because of this, and also because our event is being recorded this afternoon, I would ask that uh, prior to stating any questions, you give your name and affiliation. Now, Colonel uh, Wurzel ha has been an observer and an expert in uh, Chinese affairs for close to 40 years. He spent a num many num uh, years in the United States Army. He was an infantry officer as well as a military intelligence officer. He traveled regularly throughout Asia while serving in the Pacific Command from 1978 to 1982. He attended the National University of Singapore where he studied advanced Chinese. He next worked for the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, developing counterintelligence programs. From 1988 to 1990, uh, Colonel Wurzel was the Assistant Army Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, after assignments as an Army Strategist and Managing Army Intelligence Officers, he returned to China in 1995 as the U.S. Army Attaché. In 1997, he became a faculty member of the U.S. Army War College and served as the Director of the Strategic Studies Institute there. He retired from the Army as a Colonel. After his retirement, he was the Director of the Asian Studies Center and Vice President for Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. He's written prolifically on Chinese military affairs, most recently a book entitled The Dragon Extends Its Reach, Chinese Military Power Goes Global, published last year by Potomac Books, and we have copies available for sale in the lobby. He's made numerous media appearances, CNN, Fox News, NBC, uh, PBS NewsHour, of course, most recently, last Sunday's Washington Post. He is a graduate of the United States Armed Forces Staff College and the U.S. Army War College. His Bachelor of Arts degree is from Columbus College, and with his MA and PhD are from the University of, of Hawaii. Welcome, uh, Dr. Blair Woodson. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Much. I guess uh, you'll have uh, Jim Carapano on your faculty now. We do. We're very honored. Yeah, it's a kind of a you know a, a sad day for me because I knew uh, really I don't walk for a very long time. He always had me in to cover this particular block. Uh, but he's an example of why y'all are really, students are right here. One row, two rooms, one row. Oh, uh, uh, so lucky to be at a place like the Institute of World Politics. Uh, I, I met Walter when I was working in counterintelligence and investigative programs. And uh, he was responsible for all kinds of uh, clandestine activities for the Department of Defense from a policy standpoint. So I, I couldn't run a double agent operation or write the operations plan for a double agent operation without John Yanko approving it. You know, he, he, uh, and it was ethical, so he, he really fits in here. Uh, but that's, that's the beauty, uh, in my view, of this place is uh, you don't just get academics, you get real practitioners. Uh, so it, it, it's a really good place to go to school. I, I try and do this, uh, to, I try and start out by giving you a feel for what at least I think is the way that the Chinese military and security apparatus and the, and the Communist Party think about China's history and China's place in the world. So if you'll bear with me for the first few minutes, I'm going to do a little old history. 
and then as we go along on uh, strategy and I get into some operational principles, I, I hope it'll be clear where those things uh, appear today in, in, in party policy uh, or in military strategy because they're, they're really informed uh, by, this, by this history. Sam, you're helping the first slide. That's what we're talking about. Uh, not a whole map, you know, goes all the way out to there. <laughs> uh, actually went further a couple of times. Uh, it, 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 and go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and, and this is how they view the area today. Uh, this first island chain down here, they, I mean, today their policy is really uh, to be able to control this area and to be able to deny the U.S. the ability to operate flexibly. And of course you have contested areas with India. Uh, but one of the points I'll make is during the Yuan Dynasty, during the Mongol Dynasty, I mean, China really went all the way out into here. And, and at different times, all the way to there, and certainly to there. And, and you'll see this reflected uh, as we go along. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese uh, in 111 BC through 940 AD had successive invasions of northern Vietnam. And these were, these were tributary states, vassal states, with China as kind of the suzerain, the, the, the major regional power. The, the, whoever was the emperor of China didn't necessarily dictate every policy to the emperor in Vietnam. But he had to pay a certain amount of uh, tribute, and uh, there were limits on the range of the actions that these tributary states could take. Uh, the Yuan Dynasty, uh, which I think goes back to the 11th century AD, invaded Burma, Vietnam, Sakhalin Island, and Laos, and tried to invade Japan twice. Uh, Zheng He, the uh, Cheng Ho, if you don't read Chinese or know the, the transliteration, was the, uh, the, the, the admiral that led seven major naval expeditions between 1405 and 1433, all the way to Africa and around Southeast Asia. Anybody ever been down to uh, Malaysia? You know, you go to Singapore and Malaysia, all, all those uh, uh, trading ports, when Zheng He pulled up there, he, uh, he didn't say, hey, we got a few things on our boats, do you want to trade? Uh, his fleets were 300 ships, 27,000 infantry and cavalry, and, and lots of guns. And he pulled up and said, okay, here we are. We're going to establish a trading relationship. And, and that, that kind of mirrors the way you see China behaving at times with the Philippines and Vietnam today. So it's not new behavior. Uh, and the other thing is a deep-seated fear of rebellion. Let's go ahead to the next slide, sir. Uh, so he, here's a little bit about the example. So 11th century, 12th, Mongol rule in Korea, 1231 to 1259. Zheng He, Kushinga, Zheng Chenggung, 1624 to 1642, the first time the Chinese actually occupied Taiwan for a short time. Uh, I, I, you know, this is something older always do. Who's been to Vietnam? Hanoi. 
What? You have to look. Is it the Dow sisters that have the, the monument in the lake where John McCain landed in Hanoi? Hmm. I see somebody shaking their head. Anyway, there's a monument to, to sisters uh, who led an anti-Chinese rebellion in, in northern Vietnam, uh, and I think that was the ninth century. And, and uh, I mean, again, I bring this up because of this history of expansion and contraction. If you look at China's map today, it begins to look like the map that existed under the Mongols, under the Yuan Dynasty, uh, not like the map before that where you had three kingdoms in central China competing with each other. Or, or even during World War II. Uh, so I'll go into uh, Xi Jinping's vision for a, a modern China uh, later as we go on, but his idea of recovering the sort of prestige that China had in earlier times goes back to these things. It really was the dominant kingdom and, and, and probably on the whole Asian continent. Go ahead the next one. Again, I threw in lots of maps in case I have to go back. Next slide again. Uh, the other thing that, uh, as much as I hate to be accused of of, of defending the Communist Party's view on affairs, the, 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 the education system in China, uh, and really the, the history that every child and adult learns, concentrates on a series of millennial rebellions. So the idea of the populace, populace rising up and rebelling against the center, uh, against the emperor, has brought down dynasties over the centuries. And if you ever read the old romance of the Three Kingdoms, Yang Wo, uh, it this deals with uh, a Taoist millennial sect uh, in 184 AD that began to challenge uh, the, the, the emperor. And it, it, the whole book, uh, it, it has many of the military principles that informed Mao Zedong's thinking uh, in terms of deception, in terms of forming alliances. But it, it also uh, is probably one of the first of the millennial uh, rebellions. Li Zicheng, 1620, anti-Ming dynasty, weakened it, didn't bring it down. The White Lotus Rebellion was Buddhist. By then it was the Qing dynasty. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion is particularly interesting. Uh, I think Jonathan, Jonathan Spence up at Yale has a great book out, God's Chinese Son. Hung Shouchuan tried and failed a number of times to take the imperial examination to become an imperial official in China. And then he went into a monastery, a uh, Catholic monastery, uh, down in Guangzhou. Uh, and you know, when you read history, they say that he, uh, he was a schizophrenic. Whatever he was. He came out of the monastery believing that he was the son of Jesus Christ and uh, began this millennial Christian movement that moved all the way up through uh, eastern and central China almost to Beijing and was only defeated by, uh, with the help of what are today the Western European powers that went in there as mercenaries. Uh, threatened all the trading ports. Uh, 
the Nyen Rebellion, Anti Ching, Manchu, and finally, anybody ever see the old 55 Days of Peking? You know, the, the Boxer Rebellion, where eight foreign armories uh, have to relieve their legations uh, invading China through Tianjin. <coughs> See if I have them back after this. Ah. My method paid off. No, I can't find my point. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's Beijing, here's Tianjin. So uh, the, these boxers uh, cut off this whole area and, and really took over many of the legation areas. And I'll see if I can remember who they were. The Austrians, the French, the Germans, uh, the British with the Indians, the Americans, the Japanese, the Italians, who didn't have a very good combat record in the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, they eventually in invade in Tianjin uh, and <coughs> advance the 90 miles or so to Beijing. capture the uh, emperor's silver repository outside Tianjin, burn down and enter uh, the gates and enter the forbidden city in Beijing, uh, and, and stabilize things again. Now, anybody here from the army? You are. Not the only one. Anybody <laughs> ever been a Manchu, 9th <coughs> Infantry? I was an old Manchu, I was in the 9th Infantry uh, in Korea. Uh, first of the night. And the, uh, the motto of the 9th Infantry is keep up the fire. And they're called the Manchus. And the regimental uh, crest <coughs> is the number 9 surrounded by a Chinese dragon. And the reason for that is uh, it was the 9th Infantry that invaded and took that uh, silver repository. Uh, and then uh, the emperor, I mean, there's two stories. One is they just kept the silver. The other story is the emperor's emissary gave them a big, most of the silver. But they created a giant punch bowl that is about twice the size of this stand here. Uh, encircled, all silver, encircled by an imperial dragon. And every officer in the regiment got a silver goblet with that dragon around it. So as, uh, as a new officer in the 9th Infantry, I guess I went in there. I was supposed to be the infantry mortar platoon leader, and I ended up the support platoon leader. It was very disappointing. But uh, uh, you actually toast into that regiment today <coughs> with that one of those goblets and that, that punch bowl. And just to, uh, I mean, to, to give you a little bit of a good story, um, in, uh, I guess in 1988, uh, I was a major, I was the assistant army attaché, my boss was an army brigadier general, and we got invited to have lunch uh, with uh, a Chinese general that had fought in the Korean War and made the long march, and you know he he'd been in the PLA since the 1930s, and I was wearing my 9th Infantry crest, and I was all the way on the other side of the table. I was a pretty junior guy, and he had a reputation for heavy drinking, so we're drinking Galion liquor, Mao Tai, and about two thirds of the way through lunch, he says. I see we have one sworn enemy of China at the table. <laughs> and everybody's looking around. And I said, oh, I guess you recognize my crest, General. And he says, I fought you guys in Korea. I know exactly who you are. When are you going to give us our punch bowl back? <laughs> I said, you'll never get that punch bowl. <laughs> so anyway, they, I, I, I mean, it's kind of a strange story, but I tell it because these guys don't forget their own history. They don't forget their military history and go back if they can.
and they don't forget the history of these rebellions. So today, when you you see the Communist Party uh, really going crazy about Falun Gong and doing stupid things about small house Christian churches, this is why. Because the history is, when you let millennial groups grow, they become threats to the existing powers to be. Uh, so that, that sensitivity uh, hadn't been lost. And now you can go to it. Thank you. This is, uh, this is really uh, another part of elementary school education in China, and it's a part of Xi Jinping's uh, most, well, his first speech as chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, he makes reference to the century of humiliation. The Opium War, uh, 1842. Do, do I have a slide after that? Yeah, what, what do you know? Uh, overselling, British selling opium in Hong Kong, the British sailed up the coast. By then, the Chinese had built a reasonable fleet, uh, invaded again right the way we did in 1901, uh, and set up extraterritorial extra trading ports up and down the coast uh, so that uh, if you were a foreigner in one of those port cities, you were not subject to Chinese law. The Chinese police and authorities couldn't do anything about your activities. You weren't subject to their trade policy. And you had a local governor from whatever country you were from. Go ahead, back again. Uh, 1860, the French and the British were unhappy. They burnt down the old summer palace. Anybody ever been out to Tsinghua University in Beijing? Right near Tsinghua is the old summer palace. It's ruins, nothing but uh, you know a, a few stones on the ground. The Franco-Chinese War is another interesting one. Let's see if I go back to that slide. Uh, they got to fighting over uh, trade on the Red River uh, last year. Was it two years ago, there was a little fighting between the Vietnamese, two years ago, and Chinese over trade on the Red River. Well, the French got a little pissed off, sailed up, and uh, at Ma Wei Roads near Xiamen, uh, sank the entire Chinese fleet in port. Go ahead and go back. Sank it all right in port. Uh, 1894, 1895, by then China had been through what it called the self-strengthening movement. They went out and they tried to buy the best naval engines, the best naval guns from all around the world. And over about a 20 or 30 year period, actually built up a pretty modern fleet. The only problem was they couldn't reconstitute it because everything was bought elsewhere. Uh, but the uh, Japanese in 1894, if I remember right, had four, had a total of seven infantry divisions, used only four. Go ahead to that map again. Uh, one division took over this peninsula, the other division, three divisions invaded up here and took everything over. And by then, the, the other great powers, Western powers, convinced Japan uh, that they would pull back out of China. What did Japan keep in 1895? Taiwan and the entire Korean Peninsula. Why did they keep the Korean Peninsula? Does anybody know what Kamak... Well, I know you know what kamikaze means. <laughs> kamikaze means divine wind. Because in the 16th century, there were two attempted Chinese invasions of Japan out of Korea. And in each case, uh, a, a big hurricane and typhoon uh, 
really drove the Chinese back and sunk part of their fleet. So divine win. Save Japan. No love lost between Japan and China. But by then, uh, the Japanese kept uh, the whole peninsula. Go ahead. Uh, 1931, oh, well, I covered the uh, Boxer Rebellion. And then by 1931, uh, Japan was growing, took over all of Manchuria, northeast China. Uh, and in 1837, uh, by then a civil war was going on inside China between the communists and the nationalists. Due to that. Uh, the, the communists were held up probably in here in some mountain base areas. In 1934 to 35, they made what's known as the Long March all the way up into here in Yan'an. Started out with about 100,000 troops, ended up with about 30,000. And then, go ahead back to the other side. And then you, you really have two wars going on at once in China. Yeah, I mean, you have still the Civil War kind of going. The Nationalists and the, uh, and the Communists never really cooperated. And if you uh, read still well in the American experience in China, yeah, who's the good same one that wrote The Guns of August. They anyway, great history. Tuckman. Huh? Robert Tuckman. Tuckman, thank you very much. Tuckman's book, you'll see that um, uh, Stilwell, he, he actually thought that the Communist Army, the Eighth Root Army, was more effective than the Nationalists. And he, he really hated Chiang Kai-shek. I mean, there, there was no love lost between those guys. So this is what the Chinese referred to as their century of humiliation. Two sides, yeah. Next point I want to make is there really is a Chinese Communist Party. 1.4 billion Chinese run by some 87 or 88,000 Communist Party members. And, and if you wander around China, uh, the, there are party committees in every neighborhood, in every business, in every industry. Uh, and power is really invested in these seven guys. I mean, the Politburo has a, this is sort of the people that make up the, uh, the state government. But it's an interlocked system. If you're a state counselor, if you're the minister of agriculture, you're probably on the Politburo. The one point I might want to make is that the guy that's not on the Politburo is the minister of foreign affairs and hasn't been since Joe and I. So if these guys are making policy, with those guys, and you're down here, you don't have a lot of input. There's no cabinet like in the United States or in England uh, where a minister of foreign affairs can really have some strong input. Because if you're, your, your influence depends on your party position. If you're a low-ranking party guy on the Central Committee, you're lucky if you see the chairman of the Politburo Standing Committee twice a year. And if you want to see him, you've got to go through a state councilor or somebody else. And even today, the former foreign minister has moved up to state councilor, but he didn't move up into the Politburo. All right, go to the next slide. This is not a really clear slide, but these are the seven guys today. And what's hard for you to read is they, they each have portfolios. Uh, Wang Qishan is party discipline and corruption. Zhang Gaoli is really the assistant to Xi Jinping. Zhang De Zhang, it runs the standing committee of the state council. 
So, so for the for the entire government to get coordinated on a policy, let's say mobilization of the economy, it's going to take Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, and probably Zhang Dejiang to sit down and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. They'll talk to the Politburo about it, they'll get some input, and then they'll go down to uh, what boils down to the National People's Congress, a national legislature, who are all party members, uh, and, and that's how policy gets made. Good. Now, I guess I'll, I'll just pause here for a second, just in case there's any questions about what I, I have covered thus far. Uh, this really comes from uh, something that uh, Dave Finkelstein, a retired uh, Army officer who's the Vice President of the Center for Naval Analysis, wrote. I think Dave got it right. You can, you can pretty much read anything the guy writes and learn something. Uh, it, 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 they don't publish a national strategy like we started to do, but, but this is broadly the national strategy of China. The emphasis on stability reflects back to this history of rebellions and to the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s where uh, a good portion of the Communist Party was locked up in jail, including Deng Xiaoping, who was later the chairman of the party, a couple of times. And, and sovereignty and this Emphasis on sovereignty, Taiwan, control of the borders, South China Sea, goes back to this century of humiliation. And, and then finally this strong, developed country goes back to the concept that at one time, at least, China was the dominant power in Asia. So I, as I said, I think, I think Dave characterized it right. I think you'll, if you look, uh, at some of the keynote speeches of uh, particularly Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, the last two come and the current and last chair of the party, when, when you look at what they have to say about their vision for China, this is it. Go ahead. Yeah, it's now here, um, they have, you know, they have had, uh, and they put out pretty regularly what they call military strategic guidelines. And this comes out of the Central Military Commission, that, which are the leaders, the, the party chairman, uh, a, a couple of other very senior military leaders, and the chief of the General Staff Department, the General Armaments Department, the General Political Department and the General Logistics Department of the People's Liberation Army, as well as the Navy, Air Force, and Strategic Rocket Forces Commanders. They sit down, uh, they bring in some of their intelligence agencies, they bring in the foreign ministry people, they assess the world around them. What is the general trend? Is the general trend moving toward peace? or toward war and unrest, for the whole world. What is the general trend in Asia? Who is the number one enemy? Who are the secondary enemies? The primary enemy, potential enemy right now, is the United States. Potential. And the secondary enemies, as you can imagine, are American allies, Japan, India, and Russia. In the 1960s, with the ideological breakdown between Russia and China, the number one enemy was split. It was the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the, 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 the broad goal is keep a peaceful periphery and to develop China. And as Jiang Zemin, who was the party chairman then, saw it, in 1993, 
a world war was not likely. And I think that is still the assessment. And if, if you've got Xi Jinping's military strategic guidelines, a world war would not be likely. But there are unstable domestic factors. The problem of splits, potential splits, in Xinjiang, out in the west, in Tibet. Everybody know where Xinjiang is? Should I point that out on the map? West China, northwest China. Uh, and, and of course, the problem of Taiwan. Go ahead to the next slide. Oh, there's my citations. You, you can see how, right there, yeah. I mean, it's a class, y'all can, somewhere in your slide deck, you, you, you've got these citations. And, and Taylor Fravel up at MIT, I think, also does uh, a, a great job on this. But, but really, uh, I, I think Dave Finkelstein uh, has done a superb job in, uh, in laying these things out. Go ahead to the next slide. The other concept uh, that you will find reflected in all Chinese strategic literature is a uh, comprehensive national power on Zhong or Zhong He Guoli. They actually got the concept or adapted it uh, from a, a Japanese security thinker back in the 80s. Uh, translated his book, uh, but it is captured. It, it, I mean, if, if you went out to Tsinghua, which probably, and they, uh, some of the the most central security thinkers in China today, Yan Xuetong, Chu Shulong, Wang Jisa, uh, have books and books out uh, about uh, comprehensive national power. And there's a, there's a book by uh, Wu Chunqiu, uh, Da Jiang Yue Lun. It's uh, uh, China's grand, or just grand strategy is the title of it. That, that spends uh, a, 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 almost a chapter talking about comprehensive national power. The most, oh, there, there he is right there. Wu Xun Da Jiao published by the Academy of Military Science in 1998. Uh, but uh, the, the, the most interesting thing to me is that when you begin to look at all the books written about it, they have developed at these these uh, political scientists and strategic thinkers have developed an algorithm, and I don't have a copy of it, so, but it's a big long algorithm. Uh, you know, uh, economics, you know, plus one, and social power and diplomatic influence, and they put numbers to all these things, and and, and then rank all the major countries around them and in the world, uh, and using the algorithm, they figure out who has the greatest comprehensive strategic power, who's growing, who's shrinking. They're captured by it. But you see it reflected in the statements by the party general secretaries. You see it reflected in all their military thinking. Uh, I'm doing some reading on uh, the mobilization system in China now. At how do they mobilize uh, people's air defense, the, the uh, transportation and communication systems, the defense economy, and industry, and, and in every book, some of them by people from uh, the National Defense Mobilization Committee, some of them from the Mobilization Department of the People's Liberation Army and the General Staff Department, You'll see the, the, the whole object is to judge a comprehensive national power and to increase it. Go ahead, next slide. And, and you'll see a series of national military objectives uh, reflected uh, if you just read the, uh, their, their defense white papers, they're in English, you, know, you can read these things. But the number one objective is keeping the Communist Party in power. That's the number one mission of the People's Liberation Army and all of China's armed forces. And just to digress a minute, 
The People's Liberation Army are, uh, is, are the active forces of the ground forces, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Second Artillery, the Strategic Rocket Force. The armed forces of China are a militia, which today might be down to about 7 million, I think. Uh, the reserve forces, I think there's 100 reserve divisions, 100 reserve regiments. Uh, and, and the People's Armed Police, who are run jointly by the Central Military Commission and uh, the State Council, uh, and, and, and their Coast Guard. They, they, that, that's, when they talk about the armed forces of China, don't just think about the PLA. So all these militias and everybody. People's Armed Departments, People's Armed Forces Departments, down to every county level, that are still connected up to the mil larger military regions and the People's Liberation Army and the provinces. Uh, defend sovereignty, safeguard national stability, deter aggression, and build the nation. Go ahead to the next slide. Now what I'm going to do here is run through the strategic themes emphasized by a series of party chairman, party general secretaries. And the party general secretary now is the president, the head of the Central, Central Military Commission, and the state chairman. Party wrote. Uh, but, but Mao, remember, he, he comes out of that long march period. He, he helped form the Communist Party in 1921. He uh, helped organize the People's Liberation Army in 1927. He was one of the major theorists in these guerrilla base areas. He's one of the guys that led the long march. He actually got thrown out of, out of the central position a couple of times during the period of the long march. And there was this huge debate inside what was the, the A Fruit Army, the People's Liberation Army, uh, over whether to follow a, a Soviet model of a major uh, armed forces that was based on mobility, weaponry, or to run a guerrilla war. And, and when the nationalists surrounded the communists and just about wiped them out in those mountains in central China, it, it pretty well made the decision for them. So he focused on guerrilla warfare, he focused on you know, people's war, uh, and, and he also felt that he had to respond to two hostile nuclear powers, because until 1964, China didn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, the U.S. and Russia. And one of the things he did, uh, back up and find me a little the map, so I don't think I have one after this. That's it. Anyway, he, he created this thing called the Third Line. And it was a, the, the Third Line program. And it was a concept that it, it, if one of these major powers invaded China or started a world war, the country had to be prepared to be broken up and to be able to survive in independent parts. So he re created redundant military factories, redundant economic bases, steel manufacturing, coal mining, uh, redundant armories, a lot of them underground. Uh, in, primarily the southwest and part of western China. So it's, it's in here, it's in here, it's up in here, and to a certain extent up in here. Uh, and and I, I don't know if, if, if any of you have seen Phil's Carver, Phil Carver from Georgetown, it got a lot of publicity, the, the tunnel complexes that Carver writes about, and, and the George Washington University students. That's part of the old third line. Um, horribly ineffective because it was so distributed. 
it, it didn't make sense uh, economically because you, you couldn't necessarily create the infrastructure to manufacture steel in some of the areas, but he insisted on the tunnel. Go ahead back to that now. Uh, yeah. People's war, it, it, the, the, uh, the guerrilla warfare depends on the populace. Uh, Mao's concept was you have to be able to mobilize the masses of China politically and militarily if you were going to be able to defeat a, a major invasion by one of these hostile powers. Uh, recovering Taiwan continues. You know, he, he actually tried to do it a couple of times, invading a couple of small islands run by, uh, controlled by the Taiwanese off the Chinese coast and, uh, and actually recovered one where they, every year, they'll run uh, an invasion exercise back on that island as kind of a warning to Taiwan that we can still invade. Probably they really can't, but you know, they want to keep the threat there. Uh, he, he wanted to see even development. This was another huge debate inside China, uh, particularly in the first five-year plan, uh, I think up to about 1956 to uh, whether to allow cities, regions to take advantage of natural resources and natural geography and develop at their own rate, or do you develop the whole country uh, in communes at a slow rate, keeping it e evenly developed. Now won that fight. And then again, identify the main enemy and the secondary enemies. Uh, interestingly, the, 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 through Mao, I, almost through today, there's never been a war with the main enemy. There have been wars with secondary enemies. Uh, India as kind of a client state of the Soviet Union. Vietnam invaded 1979 at that time and transformed to a client state. Opposing the United States from 1961 to 1975 uh, with as many as 50,000 troops at a time in Laos and northern Vietnam, but uh, not to take on the United States directly. The Korean War, a couple hundred thousand Chinese on the Korean Peninsula fighting UN forces, but not a direct fight against the United States, but rather against the secondary enemy. Uh, and finally, uh, there was this ideological uh, bent to spread communism throughout the Third World. And, uh, and a competition between the Soviets and the Chinese for whose model and which party would be the leading party in the Third World. Go ahead to the next one. He, he's really, he's actually followed by some, a couple of people that didn't last for a very long time. But um, the, the, the next really big strategic thinker and leader was Deng Xiaoping, who was a, a contemporary and fought alongside Mao and argued with him from 1921 uh, up to the time Mao died. And Deng uh, actually attended uh, college in France with Ho Chi Minh. So they, they got around. Uh, but his theme is, that, uh, if you read Mike Pillsbury, he writes a lot about it. Uh, how long you have to play, which, which translated means hide your capabilities, keep a low profile, and be somewhat circumspect about your activities and what you intend to do. The idea was, don't antagonize the main enemy. Uh, focus on economic development. There's Pillsbury's translation. Buy time and build ourselves. Now, while he was doing that, Dung did a couple of very interesting things. I talked about this 1979 invasion of Vietnam. Um, I think I was it. 
the Intelligence Center Pacific at the time, it was very interesting because we had a pretty good handle on where the main force armies of the People's Liberation Army were, uh, where the garrisons were, when they trained, they would watch them, listen to them, and then all of a sudden it's like, boom, we lose them. We don't know where they are, but we're hearing all these reports of uh, unrest on the Vietnamese border and things going on. And uh, we had, well, I, I wasn't in China. I actually got into China in 79, but, but uh, a, uh, a, retired, uh, a retired Army Air Corps officer went all the way out to the old uh, Flying Tigers bases, because he'd been with them in World War II, and came back by train. And it, when he got back to Hong Kong, he walked into the American consulate and asked to see uh, one of the defense attaches. And he said, you know, I, uh, I got held up at all these major train junctions on my train, and they were just hundreds of rail cars going through loaded with armor vehicles and artillery and everything else. And then we said, okay, it's not an exercise. We know where to start looking for the PLA. And they had a couple thousand main force troops built up down there by the time we figured it out. Now, there are arguments about whether one of Dung's goals was actually to sort of punish the Vietnamese, first of all, for going uh, into Cambodia and threatening a client state of China, or whether it was to punish the Vietnamese for growing too close to the Soviets and beginning to offer bases in the Soviets. Uh, I guess Ezra Vogel's book on Dung really has a, a very fruitful discussion of it. But, but in the end, it, it was, uh, it, they invaded for about 50 kilometers along the entire Sino-Vietnamese border, which is pretty long, uh, formed two theaters of war, one in the north in case the Soviets reacted, one in the south, and inside the southern theater of war, two areas of operations controlled by different generals, uh, and in 30 days, you know, they marched roughly 50 kilometers in, lost a lot of people, maybe lost 50,000 people, and then pulled back out. And then when he got the PLA out, he says to him, Dung says to him, look, uh, command and control was bad, the weapons didn't function, we didn't have proper mobility, we're going to go back and focus on building the economy and building a stronger PLA. And that, that really sort of covers Dong Xiaoping's role. Next one. Jiang Zemin comes after him. Uh, and this is about the time of the Tiananmen Massacre. If you remember 1989, June 1989, that the Politburo Standing Committee was absolutely paralyzed about uh, and in arguments with old senior leaders from the Long March, uh, and in, with itself, about how to handle uh, these students. And it wasn't just an uprising in Beijing. The most violent uh, ended up Beijing, but almost every major city of China at that time had these uprisings of workers and students complaining over corruption in the party, complaining over um, economic conditions, complaining over inflation. And uh, well, we know how it got worked out in Beijing. About 12 infantry and armor divisions moved into Beijing, killed a bunch of people, 2,300 to 3,600, 3, we think, uh, and uh, restored order. In most other cities, order was restored uh, more easily and more peacefully, Jiang Zemin was running Shanghai. Find me another map. There, there, there you go. So, uh, 
Shanghai is here. You had real huge riots here, here, Xi'an, Chengdu, Wuhan, Lanzhou, all around Chongqing. But uh, somehow, Jiang Zemin managed to resolve this uh, relatively uh, calmly in, in Shanghai. And uh, now go back to Jiang Zemin. Sorry. It, and he's made uh, party chairman, replacing Dung. Dung stays alive for bunches of years after that. So very influential. He actually, I mean, we used to have Deng Xiaoping death watch. We hear once a week. I, I was back in China in 95 to the end of 97, and somebody had to ride by his compound every day. Because we'd hear, you know, did he die? Did he not die? He had, uh, he apparently had prostate cancer for decades, but, you know, don't, don't get too nervous if you've got prostate cancer. You know, if it's slow growing, it took him about 25 years. Uh, in, in any case, uh, Jiang Zemin comes in, and um, the new <coughs> problem for him is, uh, I, I guess, a fairly influential group, primarily in the United States of neoconservatives, who argued that the rise of a great power invariably causes war. Paul Kennedy, was he at Yale or Harvard? Um, uh, guy out of Chicago whose name escapes me. And, and uh, John Zemin and, and the guy who headed the Central Party School, John B. Jen, uh, go on this new camp, new ideological and, and really international campaign. To convince primarily the United States, but also Western Europe, Australia, Japan, and Southeast Asia, that a new power could rise peacefully. And uh, you'll find Harvard's published Jung Bi Jen's lectures at, at the time, because it was the counter to. The, Kennedy, the, the, the Paul Kennedy thesis that, that when a great power, a new great power rises, you necessarily would have a war. And, and what part of national strategic objective? Keep a peaceful environment, grow the economy. Uh, it, it, it was really designed as a counter to the China threat theory. It explicitly mentioned the rise of Japan in World War II and Germany in World War I and World War II and said China can rise without threatening the existing international order. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Uh, go to the next, well, let me stop. Don't go to the next slide. There's a very interesting debate that goes on inside the Communist Party and really in the Central Military Commission and the People's Liberation Army. Because you, you see articles in um, uh, military journals, China Military Science and military newspapers, uh, arguing that the peaceful rise theory limits the ability of the People's Liberation Army to develop itself into a modern army. But the two things are contradictory. That you, you, the PLA cannot, and it, it, it's, you know, by then, you know, we're into, I mean, the Gulf Wars happened in 91. So the Chinese watched what the United States did in the first Gulf War. The Chinese watched what the British did in the Falklands Islands. The Chinese watched what we, not we didn't do a great job, but what we did in Panama and Grenada. And they watched what was going on in Kosovo and Yugoslavia. And they, they, the, the military strategists were saying this theory ultimately will not allow China to develop the kind of military it needs. Go ahead to the next one. 
Hu Jintao comes in, his first speech uh, on December 24, 2004, was to the assembled, assembled political commissars of the People's Liberation Army Air Force. And he, he cranks out uh, new historic missions for the People's Liberation Army. Uh, the, 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 the military, first of all, remains a force to guarantee the Communist Party's rule. This goes right back to all these millennial rebellions that I talked about at the very beginning. The second mission is to safeguard national development and sovereignty. Very standard mission. Watch your periphery. Watch the areas around the country. The third mission is very new. Uh, up to this time, the People's Liberation Army really focused on defending China's borders, uh, worrying about what was going on on the periphery. They had a brown water navy that couldn't go out beyond that first island chain I had there and rarely did that. You know, it was worried about the waters close into China. But what happened, you know, in, in, uh, both in 94 and two, I mean, two, uh, 91 and 2001, the PLA watched us take out entire command and control systems and militaries from 1,500 miles away. And at the same time, China begins to expand its own international interests. It's got huge investments in Africa. It's got huge investments in the Middle East. It, it's got uh, a, a client state relationship with Pakistan and Bangladesh. It's got a client state relationship in Burma. It's dependent on sea lines of communication for 70% of its oil. And, and this is what's new. Hu Jintao says to them, uh, you have to develop a military capable of providing strategic support for China's expanding national interest. Now the guy I think that's done the nicest job writing about it is um, Dan Hartnett, Daniel Hartnett, H-A-R-T-N-E-T-T. -T -T. Uh, he was at the Center for Naval Analysis. Uh, if you have access to OSC, Open Source CIA's Open Source Center, he's got a great uh, monograph on the topic on OSC. But if you don't have access to the Open Source Center and that Open CIA resource, you, you can read it in, um, he, he testified in front of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission and set out the thesis of what these historic missions mean to them. And I covered them up. Uh, and then finally, uphold world peace and promote mutual development. And, and Uphold world peace sounds very simple, but today, you know, I think they've had 18 or 19 Chinese missions into the Gulf of Aden task forces of three or four ships. Uh, they are the largest contributor of troops to United Nations peacekeeping operations. So, so they take that kind of seriously. It teaches them a couple of things. It teaches them independent <laughs> leadership. Uh, teaches them long-range command and control, and at the same time, uh, I don't think it's just lip service, but they are, you know, they're a per permanent five member of the United Nations, so it, it, uh, it, it demonstrates their commitment there. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Xi Jinping comes in in 2012. Uh, his first big speech was to the assembled political commissars of the Second Artillery Corps, the Strategic Rocket Forces. And uh, it, it, his theme is the China dream. This is the kind of China we want to see. National revival and strength. That goes back to the idea of 
China in the, oh, you know, I would say 9th to the 17th century being the central state and all the surrounding states being tributaries. Uh, remember past humiliation by foreign powers. Don't forget what the British did. Don't forget the Boxer Rebellion and the eight foreign armies that invaded. Don't forget the Korean War. Don't forget the Japanese in World War II and the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. Still, you want to build a wealthy state. Now, Unlike Mao Zedong, who says it's got to be even development, you want a moderately wealthy society, but it may not be exactly even everywhere. Folks that trickle down, folks would catch up. Uh, a powerful modern military, and to make the Chinese people prosperous and happy, and finally, that charge to the People's Liberation Army and the Armed Forces, Preserve Communist Party rule. And this is, this is kind of where we are today. I, I mean, what, what I find interesting today is you have what I call a modulation of um, antagonistic threats and even antagonistic actions, if you take a look at Vietnam and the Philippines, uh, modulated by fairly strong and effective economic policy initiatives and investments. So at the same time, they're moving these oil rigs down off the Vietnam coast. You have Lee Keqiang, the premier, going down to Vietnam and signing all kinds of economic development agreements. The idea is money can come your way if you stay in line. You get out of line, and it can go the other way, and I have the military that can do it. Uh, Japan, it, uh, well, there's, there's an awful lot of bitterness there, so uh, it, it, it's a little different case. But yet, uh, last week, when uh, Abe uh, was in Beijing, everybody expected they wouldn't even meet, and they come out with a couple of agreements, probably a reasonable get-together. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a sophisticated uh, set of policies involving both coercion and uh, economic inducements that, that's operating around Asia. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody today can say who's articulate. Here, people say, "Oh, this is all Xi Jinping." Uh, I certainly don't think it is because it's something that can't be done without Zhang Zhejiang and Li Keqiang and, and the state apparatus and the economy. So you 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 see a um, a Politburo Standing Committee where where certainly Xi Jinping is the central guy, but they seem to be working pretty well together. And uh, at least I, I don't know anybody that could say today that, oh, here's the architect of that policy. But, uh, but it's an effective one. Okay, go to the next one. Now, I'm going to make, make a strategic shift here and go into strategic military thinking. So let me just pause for a second and first, if anybody from the class has a question at this point, at this point, go ahead and ask it. And if not, anybody else in the audience. All right. I, I want to distinguish between a stratagem and a strategy. Historically, and this is really, you, you'll find it woven throughout uh, Chinese historical military writings, a stratagem is a deceptive tactic or ruse or subterfuge. It's designed in a given situation to gain the upper hand. 
Whereas a strategy, as we think about it, uh, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Army War College. You're from the Army War College, or the National War College, or even the Air War College. You're reading Art Lickey. A strategy is ends, ways, and means. You all familiar with the rainbow plans? You know, the orange plan, the red plan. Well, they, I mean this. The, the, the rainbow plans were not built to fight Japan and Germany. That, that whole set of plans that we really pulled out and used for World War II were written to fight England in the Atlantic and Japan in the Pacific during the time of the Anglo-Japanese Alliance, which I think broke down with the Washington Naval Conferences in 1921 or 22, but we're still we're still thinking that our main enemies, that, that strongest powers, strongest military powers and economic powers, probably going to be Japan and England. Turns out it's Germany. <laughs> but uh, but as you can imagine, a well-crafted plan to mobilize the economy and the military, to create a military industrial base and to use it in a war in the Atlantic was just as effective against Germany as it was against England. Uh, and, and that's the way Lickey thinks about it. What are the objectives for your country? What courses of action will allow you, what ways will allow you to reach those objectives? And what resources do you have to rely on? And if one of these is inadequate, if you don't have the means, you better adjust your ways or your ends. This is the debate today about ISIL. What are your objectives? And how do you get there? And what do you want to use to get there? Now, if you go back to Clausewitz, he, he just has ends and ways. I mean, in his classical military writings. But uh, again, there's a difference between a strategy and a strategy. We had stratagems too. We used stratagems when we thought about Operation Overlord. We used stratagems when we ran Operation Torch in North Africa. And we used stratagems in the Korean War. One of them didn't work, one of them did. And I mean, Inchon versus going up to the chosen one. All right, go to the next slide. Uh, now, if a stratagem is a form of deception, I, I, I'm spend a little time talking about how Mao saw the principles of war. Uh, he, he believed in concentrating forces. That evolves later, and I'll talk about that. Uh, he, he, you know, I, I mean, I, I got my start as a dumbass rifleman in the Marine Corps, and uh, the indirect approach, you know, is sort of what we learned. You know, envelop and maneuver. Don't run straight up the hill into the face of fire. Just basic principle. Maneuver. Bypass an enemy's defenses. Bypass built up areas. Uh, use surprise. And then what you want to do with deception is use it to force the enemy to concentrate dispersed forces where it's useful to you. Where you can concentrate force and annihilate. Now believe in battles of annihilation. So deception fits in there, but you know the, the, the sort of common perception is all Chinese warfare is based on deception. It's not. Okay, go ahead. Uh, now this is just it. it Chinese ranks are really very heavily informed by the use of strategy and deception. And 
if, if uh, Mao actually gave a bunch of lectures in 1938 at the guerrilla base in Yan'an in North West China on uh, it, that drew on some of these books, but for for folks that don't want to go into classical Chinese, uh, Michael Handel, who taught up at the Army War College, has a full book and a small monogram that is still on the Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute website. Handel's passed away. That talks about Swunza versus Clausewitz and how deception and strategy and stratagem fit into each of their writings. So if you're a student, there's probably something you ought to look at. Uh, we think of them as the maxims of war. Uh, but there are seven military classics in China, and there's a book called San Shirley Ji, The 36 Strategems. And these are taken from either Chinese history or historical novels that meant to recount centuries-old battles where deceptions or ruses uh, led to victory. Go ahead to the next slide. Mao focused on uh, guerrilla warfare primarily because that's what he grew up in. He was surrounded by the nationalists or he was surrounded by the Japanese or both. And uh, he believed that if you mobilize the masses of people, you could conduct a protracted war that would uh, deplete Japanese forces and resources and eventually lead to victory. And he did it from secure base areas. Uh, now, the, the relationship between attack and defense is kind of critical in Mao's thinking because uh, they're completely interrelated. And so even today, if, if the, when the Chinese attack Vietnam and uh, India, they call it a self-defensive counterattack. And it was pretty damn offensive. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, it cleared, a lot of these things, you know, we, we, we all know, but uh, there were radar operations conducted by, at the regimental level by some of uh, Mao's forces, but for the most part, they were guerrilla operations until the Civil War. Do, do I have something next on the Civil War? Go to the next slide. Well, I'll keep this. No, go back. There are actually uh, a series of campaigns that took place in the Civil War between 1946 and 49. Uh, first in the Northeast, in, uh, in, in, around Xinjiang and Sukhoi. Next around Beijing uh, and Tianjin. And then finally in the area of Nanjing and Shanghai, the Pai Hai campaign, where you could watch this guerrilla army uh, up in the Northeast it is the first time that the military forces of China, PLA, uh, gathered together and attempted to form what we would call uh, a, a, a full uh, army with different arms and services and conduct maneuver warfare. And it took them quite a long time to get it. And ultimately, they achieved it when they captured a whole bunch of old Japanese weapons and a whole series of nationalist generals defected and write, wrote them uh, operational manuals. So if you go to Tianjin, I, I, I spent a couple of days at the, in Tianjin is the Pingjin, <coughs> Beijing Tianjin uh, Campaign Museum. They actually have these manuals, handwritten and then mimeographed, and they were written in a matter of months by nationalist generals, and I, you know, I said to the curator, how the hell did they do this? You know, I mean, it, 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 if, when, when you, if you think that you're dealing with a military that can't show initiative and adapt, it took them about 90 days to make this transition from a bunch of collective guerrilla forces to maneuver warfare supported by uh, artillery and armor and using uh, 
vehicles for mobility. So they're capable of that. Anyway, they moved down to uh, Beijing and Tianjin. Three separate campaigns run three different ways, one of which really violated all of Mao's own principles. Uh, they conducted a classic maneuver war west of Beijing and just beat the hell out of the nationalists. And then shifted focus on Tianjin. And if you've been there, uh, it's, it's a very densely built up urban area. And they attempted to penetrate those defenses and lost loads of people. Uh, violated one of his basic principles. And then uh, the, the Beijing third part of the campaign was very interesting. They got the daughter of the nationalist garrison commander in Beijing, which was called Beiping at the time, and convinced her to go to her father and uh, convinced him, convince him that if he did not surrender, the communists would reduce that city in detail and annihilate the army uh, slowly at great cost as they did in Tianjin. And he gave up. You know, he surrendered Beijing. So, I, I mean, for me, it's, it's kind of a classic example of three forms of warfare, including psychological operations and information operations. And then they moved down south by the, uh, to the Huai Hai campaign, and um, it, in a, a really uh, classic case of maneuver warfare, helped again by some nationalists that defected or didn't fight. Or, or wouldn't commit their troops. Uh, they, the, the nationalists at the time had the habit of commit, committing troops in peacemeal. You know, every general that came out of the warlord period in China, every general wanted to keep his own army because if he didn't have it, he didn't know if he could trust the next commander who was a warlord. So instead of everybody working together, there were a couple of very effective generals, but for, for the most part, they tended to commit their troops in piecemeal which allowed Mao's maneuver forces to really defeat him in detail. Anyway, interesting period. Now you go. Uh, People's War uh, is really Mao's signature concept. And uh, it, it was designed primarily for continental defense. Uh, against the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and it intended to use the large population areas and difficult terrain uh, to fight a stronger enemy. He, he wanted to yield time and space. Remember I talked about that third line. He was convinced he had areas of China that would survive and that any enemy that attempted to invade and defeat, and this included Taiwan because the Republic of China still was intent on recovering the mainland, uh, uh, it, it, would, it would slow down an invader, deplete an, an invader, and uh, allow uh, China to, to defend it, its continental base. Next uh, slide. By, uh, by the time we get into the 1980s, uh, and, and particularly the early 90s, the PLA has realized, uh, and the guy Su Yu, who was, he's the guy that came up with People's War Under Modern Conditions, he, he goes back to uh, the Long March and the Korean War. And, and these three campaigns of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the war against the nationalists for the Revolutionary War in 46 and 49. But he, he, he really argues that modern conditions and high technology mean that uh, wars will probably be local or regional and not global. And that if you're going to win in a war, you have to be able to fight air, ground, uh, and naval forces jointly. Uh, they have to be aided by information systems and information technology, what we call today C4ISR, 
command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and that you have to integrate all your forces across the domains of war. Air, ground, naval, the sea, space, and the electromagnetic spectrum. Next slide. All right, I'm going to take a break here. We're going to take about 10 minutes. All right, we're going to go to the key issues today for the people's liberation. Uh, we already talked about the historic missions that uh, Mr. Hu Jintao came out with December 24, 2004. Keep the party in power, manage unrest, control sovereignty and the big one that, that creates a global PLA, a PLA that has to be able to act outside China's periphery, watch out for China's vital interests. Today, they really have, um, and it, it's an interesting process. I, think, yeah, I mean, I've been reading that. I started out doing this crap in 1970. <laughs> I had been in the Marine Corps as a grunt. Got out, went to college, got my wife pregnant, needed a job, re-enlisted in the Army. And I enlisted to uh, study Chinese and be a voice intercept operator in 98 Gulf, intercepting Chinese forces in Vietnam and Laos. So I spent a couple of years doing that, then got commissioned. But um, so I've been reading <coughs> Chinese and reading military doctrine for a long time. I, I, I think it's, it's about a decade ago, maybe 15 years now, that you began to see their military writings talk about uh, space, undersea warfare, cyber warfare, and sovereignty protection as linked concepts. And that what they were doing then was always citing primarily U.S. Air Force doctrine and some U.S. Army doctrine. You know, they'd steal it, they'd get it, it's online. I, I once escorted um, the Deputy Chief of Staff for the People's Liberation Army to the U.S. Uh, with the head of the Strategy Department at Academy of Military Science, and we went to TRADOC, U.S. Army Training Doctrine Command at Fort Monroe. And uh, everything was very pleasant. We went to a baseball game, went to eat, sat down in a meeting. And the Chinese major general, the head of strategy, pulls out a list of American Army field manuals in English and hands them to Bob Scales, the major general Scales, who later was the at the Army War College and says, uh, can we get these manuals? Uh, and that's all it was. It, it, I mean, it was cyber warfare. It was uh, electronic warfare. It was operational concepts. It was you know, net-centric integration. You, you know, I, I said, General Scales, I said, I'll tell you what. Send them to me in Beijing, and if we can trade manuals, he'll get them. <laughs> Somehow he managed to get them. They got them. But anyway, he, he, 10 or 15 years ago, they were citing American publications and sometimes Russian publications, particularly on electronic warfare. And then now they're generating their own stuff. So, so they, they, they don't cite foreign publications to that extent anymore. They are developing their own doctrine. It, it's doctrine that fits them. And, and I say fits them because um, their command and control is very different. They're able to network units at, on the ground, really primarily at regimental level, maybe sometimes battalion level. But, but you know, it's not like every soldier can pull up a picture of the battlefield and talk to each other. So, so they understand their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the other thing that's reflected in their, um, their writing 
is that, uh, particularly in the United States, but they're getting that way. It is so dependent on space systems uh, for intelligence and surveillance, as well as for communications command and control. Excuse me, that if you want to talk about information warfare and information operations uh, and penetrating computer networks, you can. They, they think you can really cripple the United States in particular if you cripple space systems. So it's, it's more and more sophisticated. Uh, they, they, their satellites are pretty much dual use, but uh, their, uh, I mean, part of their doctrine is that it, it, they watch how we're using civilian satellites to carry our military traffic. I mean, it's also almost uh, the, the laws of war in the sea columns <coughs> apply to space. If, if a satellite is carrying enemy military traffic, that satellite becomes a valid target for combat operations, wherever it is. So it's fairly sophisticated. And then they're really studying how to apply the laws of war, whether it's land warfare or maritime warfare, to space and in the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's, it's, uh, it's not the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, that we fought in Korea or that invaded Vietnam. It's a very, very different. Now, some things they always did very well. I have a colleague, friend, I don't know what to call him, very long-term contact, who was the military assistant to the chief of all Chinese military intelligence. But I was the assistant army attaché, so I've known this guy since 88. And he, <coughs> his father commanded a, a, a Chinese division in Korea. Had a lot of interest in the Korean War. And he got access to closed military and party archives and created, I mean, it must be a thousand pages. Uh, wrote it in English. His, Coincidentally, we have a very similar background. I did SIGINT against Chinese forces during Vietnam. He did SIGINT against U.S. forces during Vietnam. So, you know, his English is pretty good. We, you know, we can tell the worst stories. Anyway. But, uh, so he hands me a thousand pages. And he says, why don't you take a look at this? And maybe you'd want to edit it, you know, and help me publish it. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> You know, it, it wasn't badly written, but if you've ever read Chinese books, they develop very differently than what we might write. And, uh, but, but he had an appendix that cataloged uh, signals intelligence intercept and electronic warfare operations against UN forces in Korea. So this isn't new to these guys. They, they, they have just adopted it. It's very interesting for me to, to, to look at. So they're thinking about how to apply the laws of war in modern military operations. And now we can go to the next slide. So thank you. And, 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 and like us, uh, they see warfare as being conducted uh, today in five domains. Uh, see it under see your link for them. Uh, in the air, and uh, you know, just as we talk about aerospace, Siphon Jun is their primary aerospace writer. They kind of link air and space today. Uh, and then finally, th they put, they, they call it the electromagnetic spectrum because they see classic electronic warfare, you know, jamming, meeging, all the things you think about in EW. Uh, together with information operations and cyber warfare. Uh, and as I said, they see it functioning in space. Now, I, I think the difference uh, between them and, and some of our thinking is most of our thinking is at the operational level of war, you know, in theaters or at the tactical levels of war. 
Whereas their thinking in all these things uh, runs through all levels of war. So they, they think about using uh, cyber operations at the strategic level to disrupt uh, our, our time phase force and deployment lists, to, dis to disrupt our logistics flow. Uh, to disrupt ports of, and airfields of embarkation, to, to disrupt, you know, we have this, we have this discrete uh, network uh, of um, on-time delivery that really depends on civilian suppliers and sometimes civilian shippers, and they've figured out how to get, they, they, well, conceptually, how to get into that, divert shipments, things like that. They, they, it, when you read their their writers, they they understand how, uh, for instance, for aerial refueling, you know, you got one set of command and control coming out of is it Scott Air Force Base or somewhere out there? It, it, it is Scott, isn't it? And, and, and you have uh, another tactical set coming from a, a, probably. Uh, you know, maybe it'd be Seventh Fleet, maybe PACAF, maybe USA, U.S. Air Forces Japan, telling folks where to go, and, and, and they're talking about things like sending the refuelers to the wrong place, or, or sending fighters or bombers to the wrong place. So, so it's sophisticated and it operates through all levels of war, and it understands what we do, and and they're targeting us and the Japanese. Not so much the um, the Russians today. They're, they're getting along pretty well. Uh, the, the other, I, I find it a potentially escalatory and dangerous concept. Uh, they have a series of books. They translated as the science of military strategy, uh, the science of military campaigns, and the science of military tactics. And they have one volume, uh, the Arpao being John Ishria, which is the science of second artillery campaigns, the science of <coughs> missile campaigns. Yeah, one of the things they did was analyze um, the, the Iraqi use of ballistic missiles in the first Gulf War. And their, their conclusions were that the Iraqis were idiots that they should have masked their fires uh, based on reconnaissance on U.S. troop masses and not worry about the Israelis or anybody else and focused on mass troops and, and troop concentrations. And, and, and to, to give you an idea how, how that thinking works, I, I had another trip and it had to be 1989 before Tiananmen with the head of the Academy of Military Science and the deputy <coughs> commander of the Strategic Rocket Forces. So we went all around the U.S., had a nice time. Highlight was in Dallas. We watched a Redskins Cowboys game and the owner gave us his box and the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders brought us beer. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be a military out of shape. That's all right. No? <laughs> Ain't bad work. I bet you guys don't get that. <laughs> anyway, we're flying from Washington. Uh, no, actually, we went and we actually got on a C-130 with uh, a ranger company out of Savannah and flew to Arkansas. And the Rangers jumped while we air landed under them in time to watch them land. You know, it was, I mean, it was kind of a memorable trip. This is pre-Vietnam attack while the United States and China were conspiring together against the Soviets and against the Vietnamese. We wanted to make them stronger. That's, that was Weinberger's, you know, Weinberger and, and Reagan's approach. So. Anyway, we went from there, and we're going to Disneyland. You know, we're going to California, show a little American culture. 
And uh, I'm sitting next to this Chinese <coughs> major general from the Strategic Rocket Forces, and he's got uh, anybody in the Air Force? You, you guys use one over a hundred, right? For air nav maps? I don't know. He's got this big scale map of the United States, all in Chinese, and he's looking at it. And, and, and I, I said, well, General, what are you doing? And he says, uh, I think that we are near Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Arizona. I said, so? He says, well, can we go look at your missile fields? I said, well, there's no missiles there anymore. We got rid of them. Davis Mountain is now an aircraft graveyard and all the silos are in. He said, I just want to look, you know? So I, we're, we're in, I don't know, it was a fairly, maybe a seven, it's a small plane. Went up, talked to the Air Force pilot, and I said, hey, can you make a pass over the old missile fields at Davis Mountain? And he said, yeah, I'll call them and see what they say. And they said, okay, 3,000 feet, go ahead. And we went down to 3,000 feet, and this guy And I said, he, he said, this is the way missiles ought to be. And I said, well, what do you care? You know, you've got multi-megaton warheads that'll take out cities. And he says, no, you don't understand. We believe in mass fire. We believe in massed artillery fire, and we believe in massed missile fire. So, to me, this is what a missile feels, because if you've ever been over Davis, it must be hundreds of silos, all in a relatively small area. He says, well, why do you, he says, you know, we thought you understood us. I was a major, major. Why do you think they call us the second artillery? So, it's a very different concept. So, today, they have concepts of co-locating their strategic missiles and their conventional missiles. Strategic missiles mean nuclear armed missiles and conventional missiles at the same base. Um, and, and, and if you think about escalation in nuclear warfare, their concepts in the science of second artillery campaign are to use demonstrations of force with conventional missiles to show what a strategic missile might do. You, you know, and I've had this debate in China. I said, well, you, you know, we, we've got satellite systems that are going to pick up the launch. So if you launch a conventional missile at Hawaii or a US base in Japan or a Japanese base, we're not going to know whether it's conventional nuclear. You've got them co-located. You're going to put our single integrated operations plan, our PSYOP, right into effect. It's pretty escalatory. And they don't quite, you know, they still don't really think about that, and they won't talk to us about that. I mean, there's only, there's a guy by the name of Ralph Casa who runs Center for Strategic and International Studies, Pacific Forum in Hawaii. And he's actually in strategic, you know, sec track two talks, talking about these things. But they won't talk to us one on one on these things, military to military, or even, you know, war college to war college. Very, very critical stuff. So some of their concepts are very advanced, but very escalatory. Uh, the, the other concept. Sam, all go forward a couple of slides, see if I have, no, go, no, no, no. go back, I hate to do this to you, but go all the way back to my, I think it's my third map. If you can remember where we were, that's your job. There. All right. They call it counter-intervention. Why do they call it counter-intervention? <clears throat> because foreign powers have intervened in their country through the century of humiliation. We call it A2AD, anti-access area denial. <coughs> so they develop these anti-ship ballistic missiles with a range out into here of about 
the combat radius of a carrier-based fighter or about the, the range of a ship-launched cruise missile, about 1,500 miles. And, and the idea is, now you can go back, all the way back, I'm sorry. <laughs> Nope, back, back. There. So, so their idea of counter-intervention is to be able to keep potentially opposing forces, and this is primarily Japan and the United States, outside from being able to maneuver openly and easily outside and outside the range of their longest range strike weapons. So it's a fairly, and it, it, this thing started, this concept started in roughly 1995-1996 uh, when, when um, Lee Dong Hui got elected president of Taiwan. Uh, the Chinese ran a series of closure areas and missing <laughs> tests that created a notional embargo area around Taiwan. And I think Secretary Perry was Secretary of Defense. And he sent in two aircraft carriers. And the Chinese were berserk. I, I mean, I was with the Chief of the General Staff and the Minister of Defense <coughs> drinking at a cocktail party at the Mexican Embassy and they were just blue. They said, we're going to come up with missiles that will sink those aircraft carriers. And my response was, you know, there's 5,000 guys on an aircraft carrier. We went to war with the Japanese over 2,400 at Pearl Harbor. You sink an American aircraft carrier, and you're talking about a major war. You know. Anyway, they got them today. That's the way they think. They think. They, they, so, so that was 96. Probably, if he mentioned it, they were already thinking about it in 96. And, and they fielded it. Uh, and, and then finally, and, and this is where we were talking about Mike Pillsbury. Mike Pillsbury, uh, for the Office of Net Assessment, the Office of Secretary of Defense, has two books out that really talk about Chinese approaches to asymmetric warfare. Their idea is to avoid symmetric confrontations. And, and, and I would just say to you, nothing new there. Don't charge into a machine gun mess. Get it with a hand grenade. <coughs> or a rifle grenade. Or a bazooka. Or a law. But, but uh, so it's not magical. To, to think about asymmetric warfare. But, but for them, they believe that they have roughly judged American weaknesses and strengths. And they're not thinking about how to take us on symmetrically. They don't want to mirror our force or build a bigger force. They're not falling into the trap that the Soviet Union fell into. They're designing a force within their own capacity and with, with capabilities that they can create that attacks our weaknesses. Next slide. Uh, it's an interesting slide. I, I was at a conference up at Carlisle, the Army War College, with a bunch of uh, Chinese generals. It was this year, and it was a miserable time of year. So it must have been February or March, because it was snowing. And, um, the idea on both sides was how can we create uh, better military trust and mutual confidence to avoid conflict? That was the purpose of conflict. So I found, uh, Chun Zhou is one of the big strategic thinkers. You don't want to read a good article on the active defense. Chun Zhou wrote one in English, published it in one of the party newspapers. So he describes the act of defense. But anyway, I found an article of theirs in um, the Academy of Military Science Journal. And since I knew Chen Zhou would be at the conference, I figured this would be great. I'll use his article. So these are 
These are maybe one of the top strategists in China's idea of how we can avoid conflict. And, and the point I made during my remarks is we have defense and security consultations, but Chinese cancel them all the time. Maybe because we sell arms to Taiwan. We have personnel exchanges, but they're not doing a damn thing for us. We have not done military gaming, to be honest. Believe it or not, why did I have a good relationship with the military assistant to the chief uh, military intelligence officer in China? Because we do have liaison relationships and exchange intelligence. Uh, there is a military hotline. Chinese haven't answered it yet in a crisis. <laughs> didn't answer it during Tiananmen, didn't answer it during the EP3 uh, accident, didn't answer it during any of the Kitty Hawk stuff. Uh, we, we, we could, and we, we have made a new agreement to notify each other of military activities. Uh, I don't think either side is really limiting their activities. Uh, for decades, anybody ever deal with uh, the, um, what we destroyed, Pershings and what we were Russian equivalent this Anyway, intermediate nuclear force, the INF destruction, the INF treaty, we destroyed each other, we, we observed each other destroying each other's missiles and nuclear forces. Teams of Russians came to the United States and watched us. And we sent teams of Americans into Russia to watch them and ensure that um, these arms control measures were being carried out. And it, it actually did build trust, a certain amount of trust between the Russians. You know, I mean, I, I'll give you another funny war story. I, I got back from China and I was working at the military personnel center, uh, army assigned intelligence officers for the Army and foreign area officers. I get a call from an FBI guy in uh, Dallas. And he says, uh, they, two Chinese that you, let's just say we're in regular contact with, have moved to Dallas. And we want to meet you so you can talk to us about them. And then, you know, maybe perhaps introduce us. I said, fine. You know, my boss says, yeah. They fly me to some god awful little place on the Texas Louisiana border. I mean, there, there was nothing there. I've got to drive from, I don't know where in Louisiana, wherever the LSU is, and drive into Texas. And I pull into the town, and there's one hotel. And I get there about, I guess, two in the afternoon, and park, and uh, the woman, the, the, the desk clerk, says, uh, okay, uh, are you waiting for a U.S. team or a Russian team? I said, the U.S. team. She says, all right, you're on that side of the hotel. Oh, oh. <laughs> I said, where's the bar? She said, just go to the pool. So I, went, okay. so I sat at the pool. The, the, the one waitress comes out and says, uh, are you with the U.S. observer team? the Russian observer team, or the FBI surveillance team. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I would be with the FBI surveillance team. He said, sit at that table. They'll be here at four. You know? And then, you know, for about an hour, everybody's at their own little thing. And then all of a sudden, everybody's drinking together. You know, of course, by the time you get a few beers in you, it's time to eat, tell war stories. But my point is that this sort of activity really does bring on communication, where you can say, are you crazy co-locating your conventional ballistic and nuclear missiles? I mean, that is just dumb. So it, it does work. We don't do that. Uh, we have now done a joint drill or exercise. Uh, peace agreement and views on borders doesn't affect us. But in any case, it's like eight, one, two, three, Eight of the ten things on there, we're already doing. And it hasn't produced a bit of strategic trust. So 
It doesn't always work. We really do not trust each other. Next slide. Um, this is where I, 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 you know, I, I talk about this, but it, it, it is um, an amazingly flexible military within its own limitation. So that in those three years, they went from not even having artillery or armor or trucks to understand. Did everybody know what a combat trains or field trains is? I'm not seeing that. Your, your, your combat trains are your basic combat logistics supplies. Your uh, fuel, your fuel food, and your ammunition. And your field trains are a little further back from the front lines. They got your medical, and they got uh, some repairs, and, and and your personnel system, and things like that. That's decent. Uh, but you, you begin to see them uh, actually writing about these things and where to locate them on the battlefield and how to use them for multiple corps, you know, like hundreds of thousands of troops and divisions at one time. Uh, and, and then they coordinate these campaigns. So that's a relatively short time to make the transition. If you look at the U.S attack on Iraq in 1991 to what they had begun to do by 1997, you see pretty rapid transitions. And if you look at how they went from 2001, they thought they had it. You know, they thought they had captured network, Mike Burda's network, set in Ira, no, it wasn't Ira Owens, but the, the Admiral Owens' network-centric warfare. They thought they had it. Then they watched the 2001 Iraq War and said, shit, we got to factor in satellites, we got to factor in J-STARS, uh, we got to factor in all these ISR and shooter to uh, target uh, control. But, but, but they get it. Um, now, I'm back to some of Mao's directives to the People's <coughs> Liberation Army in that 1946 to 1949 campaign. And you see many of the lessons he learned from guerrilla war. That should be when and not shun. Uh, but you, you begin to see maneuver warfare and, and a very different form of thinking. Go ahead to the next one. And now, here's where I failed PowerPoint. Somewhere around you is going to be this little sheet of paper. You can look on this thing. I just could not figure out how to get that last thing out there. Um, and, and what this is, this is out of uh, the Joint Forces Staff College Staff Officer Manual, Appendix D. Uh, and it, it's really taken from Air Force Manual 1-1 and Army FM 100-1. And complete Marine Force Manual 6 4. But it compares the principles of war among various armies. And, and, and the point that I, I really want you to take away from this is some, I, I, I guess I'd say, the principles of war are immutable. That regardless of what you know, you may read and hear about either how, you know, how crafty the Chinese are or how deception and these asymmetric warfare inform everything they do. The principles of warfare are, are immutable. And, and what this chart shows is it's very clear that different militaries apply them 
in different ways and at different times. Uh, where we have mass, they have concentrations of force. And, and if you remember my story about this deputy commander of the 2nd Artillery, they believe in massing fires as well. We talk about mass as massing forces at a point of contact. They mass fires too. It's a very Soviet concept. Very much what the Soviets use in their planet. Uh, and, and you see it for the Soviets. Massing and correlation of forces. So, so there's nothing magic about the way they think. Uh, they're really not, you know, some mystical group that Americans or foreigners can't understand. Uh, but uh, they tend to apply some of the principles of war in different ways than we do. Now, on this chart, China's second. On the chart you have, it's last, fifth. That's just the way they laid it out. I think that is a really important point to keep in mind if you're studying strategy and warfare. That uh, one way or the other, everybody's applying the same principles of war. Go ahead to the next slide. And then I'm going to take it down a level. I just showed you Mao's principles of operation from 1946-47. This follows them up in more modern times. And this, this comes out of uh, one of the manuals on um, island landing operations meant for Taiwan. Okay, go to the next slide. And here it is in a different one. Um, translated in, uh, out of John E. Shea, The Science of Military Campaigns. Uh, again, asymmetric, don't try and confront an enemy directly. I mean, they really do emphasize surprise. Uh, and, and that may be somewhat of a difference. <coughs> with us. Uh, but look at the contradiction. Wait for the enemy to strike first, but use surprise and emphasize preemptive strikes. Now waiting for the enemy to strike first really comes directly out of Mao and directly out of their nuclear doctrine. It, the, the problem is when you read their nuclear doctrine, it, it, what it says is, in most common circumstances, we will wait for the enemy to strike first. And it doesn't say what circumstances might change that decision. Uh, and, and the second thing that it doesn't address is, what constitutes for them strategic warning? It, it, in other words, if, if they saw uh, the United States or Japan begin to maneuver naval and air forces, but not use them. We, we would call that, let's say, uh, period 2A in current joint force terms. You know, period 0 being static state peacetime, period 1 period of strategic warning, period two, period of tactical warning between zero and 30 days before combat. If they saw that, we were in period 2A, kind of organizing forces so we might use them or maybe we're in an exercise. How did they react? And we really don't know. And then the final part that, that really carries in some of the thinking about uh, cyber operations and electronic warfare is uh, their idea of striking soft and hard targets. And this is where 
they really mirror some of the old uh, Russian radio electronic combat, where at the zero hour, prior to hostilities, you, you begin electronic warfare and jamming, destroying an enemy's ability to communicate, and then you fire it up with precision strikes with air and aircraft, artillery, and missiles. So we really, I, I, I mean, I, I'm always fascinated with this contradiction between preemptive strikes and waiting for the enemy to strike first. And, and I, you know, I, I've never had anybody there explain it to me. But that's how I interpret it. Next one. Uh, strike the enemy's center of gravity. Nothing magic there. Trump card weapons are another... Uh, I've got to clean up some of the slides. I'm sorry about that. But that, that's another concept that they use. Uh, and Pillsbury writes about it, Sasho, Jim, Sasho, Jim. You, you know, literally kind of a magic slaying sword. Uh, and most people interpret that, most Americans interpret that to mean either the anti-carrier ballistic missile or something like that. But, but in reality, conceptually for the Chinese military, it means any weapon that uh, our system that will cripple an enemy quickly. So it could be destroying an over the horizon radar, uh, or it could be an anti-ship ballistic missile, or an attack on command and control satellites. Back to map, combine the offense and the defense. And this is, this is a very critical point. I, I mean, everybody, everybody understands interior and exterior lines. If, if the guy, somebody in the back is coming at me, and I've got a revolver and four revolvers behind me, I'm fighting on interior lines. He's coming from a distance toward me, and I can just reach back, and I got equipment and ammunition and supplies, and he's got the problem of having to cross all this space and drag whatever he might need with him. Now, the Chinese writings believe that if they ever fight the United States in particular, they have the advantage because they're fighting from interior lines. We've got to get all the way across the Pacific or all the way around from Japan or all the way out of Guam or Hawaii across a large area of the Pacific and approach their counter intervention area, that second island chain, where they can begin to degrade us. And when they're doing it, they, if, if we wipe out their satellites, they're close to home. They can use air breathers. They can use even shorter range forms of communication. Whereas the United States, over all that distance, either if they can wipe out satellite-based communication, we, we, we're stuck to continually fail fielding air breathers to relay or going back to HF, uh, HF radio. So they think they have a huge advantage because of their interior lines and their space electronic warfare and cyber strategies take advantage of that. Now this changes the closer you get. It changes for the Philippines, it changes for Taiwan, it changes for Japan. But they, they think the defender in general has the advantage. Because the defender is usually fighting from interior lines. Next slide. This is, a, I thought, well, here's two. Chun Zhou, I talked to you about. There's his article. Oh, I guess it's not the But this one's in English. If you can get, uh, in, in any case, um, 
They believe in the active defense, and this goes right back to Mao. Uh, that uh, you do use preemptive preemptive counterattacks. You do use surprise attacks. And contained in any defense is offensive action. There's no such thing as pure defense. Anyway, there's two citations for anybody that can get to anywhere. Next slide. And this is what I talked about. You know, where I said interior lines versus exterior lines. Uh, when you extend the distance, you're in bigger trouble. And I think the United States, the, the, the asymmetry, the greatest weakness for the United States is that the dependence on uh, C4ISR and space and cyber for long-range command, control, and surveillance. That's what they want to go out for. Here we are. So again, second island chain, gray, first island chain, control. And it doesn't have much to do. Oh, thank you. Was that next? Yeah. I guess I was thinking. <laughs> it doesn't have really um, much to do with some of their internal squabbles over the South China Sea. Uh, obviously, excuse me, Taiwan's right in the middle of it. And one of the Senkakus, I think, are right here. Okinawa's probably there. Uh, I mean, you, you can begin to see where um, they, they have begun uh, to build forces that can operate in blue water out past the Philippines and the Philippine Sea uh, and beyond. And uh, to build systems that can defend it uh, in, in a very sophisticated way. And, and this is what it looks like um, today. This isn't true for the ground forces. Every combat aircraft platform and every combat ship has data links in the Chinese military to facilitate target sharing and cooperative targeting. So if a destroyer picks something up, it can relay it to an AWACS and relay it to fighters. Uh, they're building a, uh, an air refueling group. They can relay it to the second artillery. And, and again, it's, their idea is keep them out that far. Meanwhile, Submarines out, and I think they got 54 attack subs now, five or six nuclear attack subs to begin to degrade out in that second island chain or beyond area. Next slide. This is, the, uh, this is out of the um, Department of Defense report on China's military power. It's the trajectory of a uh, a Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile, DF-21D, uh, where it begins uh, to go with terminal guidance. And I think the important thing to remember is that being able to do this is dependent on existing over-the-horizon radars in China. It's dependent on existing ocean surveillance satellite systems. Uh, and radar satellites that they already have in constellation with data relay satellites. So they have 24 hour look uh, almost all the way to the United States. So it's, it, it, it's fairly sophisticated. Now, this is taken 
out of an article that was published in China in about 1998 on the concept. It's not bad R&D. And it's indigenous. They, you know, they, they didn't steal this from anybody else. They stole a lot of other stuff. I, I wanted to cover their military regions. Uh, this is kind of a ground force look. I think I've got them all. But uh, they, they divide. It wasn't always 11 at one time. I think it was 16. Then it was, just went down to 11. Now it's seven military regions that broadly can become theaters of war. So when, when I walk over here, you all can hear me now. When they attacked Vietnam in 1979, this became the Southern Theater of War, commanded here by one guy with two sub-commanders, and they divided Vietnam like that and went into two major axes, and actually three major axes. For Taiwan, the, this is the Theater of War. For the South China Sea, this is the Theater of War. These two combine again. For India, this is the theater of war. These two military regions combine. For the Soviets, then unlikely today, all of these combine. And for Korea and Japan, these combine. Now, the Jinan military region is kind of an interesting one. It's, it's relatively small, but most of the quick reaction forces in China uh, that can really get moving within about 48 hours and, and uh, the, the units are fully manned uh, are in Jinan. So it's sort of the strategic military region that used to be down here. Uh, and in fact, as they began to move military region commanders around, they have a general staff system. So you don't become the chief of the general staff department, the equivalent of our chairman, unless you've commanded two military regions. And generally, that guy will have commanded G9 military region, in most cases. And even on the Central Military Commission, this high party body, you know, they still have political commissars. One of the, there's the, the chairman is the chairman of the Communist Party and the president. There's two vice chairmen. One is generally a former combatant commander who's commanded two military regions. And the other is a former combatant political commissar. And he runs personnel, security, promotions, morale, things like that. Next slide. Uh, this is out, I think, in the DOD military report, but it's their major um, uh, fuel and uh, oil and gas pipelines and supplies. So you can see 7% is coming out of Latin America, 24% from Africa, 47% of the Straits of Hormuz, and most of it passing through the Straits of Malacca. And they call this their Malacca dilemma. They see that their problem is that all that coming through the Straits of Malacca, that's easily, that's a, that's a tremendous strategic choke point that the United States or Australia or even Singapore could block up. They just ran, uh, it's really, they ran concurrently two major exercises. One was to send a nuclear submarine out to Sri Lanka. Is that Sri Lanka? Yeah. Yeah. Through, through here, I think. And the other was to run an expeditionary task group uh, of a couple of destroyers and uh, a landing platform dock with Marines embarked uh, through the Sunda. 
around. <clears throat> up that way. And out through the Philippine Sea. So they're beginning to actually exercise these concepts of a blue water navy that can protect China's interests at great distance. These are ballistic missile ranges and fans. Uh, I mean, you can see they got the United States pretty well covered. Uh, and remember, Australia, I mean, we depend a lot on the Australians, not just for the new marine base, but most of our, uh, a lot of our satellite command and control is down there, and some of our over-the-horizon radars are down there. I mean, it covers Guam. Uh, it certainly covers uh, Hawaii. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And I, I, I just wanted to put this up to remind everybody of why they consider the Korean Peninsula to be so critical. I mean, they, they saw Japan in 1894 and 95 and in 1931 drive all the way into China and that one through the Korean Peninsula. And obviously they saw U.S. and United Nations forces on their border through North Korea. So what, as painful as it may be for them, one of their strategic objectives uh, I would argue is to keep Korea divided uh, and to keep U.S. and South Korean forces from moving up along their borders. Very important to them. And it, it begins to explain to a certain extent why the, the dispute over the Senkakus, the Diagyu uh, Islands, the Aitai Islands, with Japan is so critical. I mean, it, it's about fishing rights, but it's also about proximity to Taiwan, and it, it's about uh, early warning and command and control, which is part of the explanation for an air defense intercept zone around the Senkaku Islands. Now, if you read Chinese literature, they started, believe it or not, it was the um, border defense police who were gone now that started writing about the need for an air defense intercept zone around there in 1973. So they've been thinking about it since 73. But when first Japan declared an ADIV, and then Korea declared, well, Korea's had an ADIV since we were there in 1950. But then when the mayor of Tokyo attempted to buy the Senkakus, you know, it, it sort of was the trigger for that air defense intercept zone. So not a new concept. Shouldn't have surprised a lot of people. Next slide. Same military regions with air bases, major, uh, major air bases and air armies. Uh, next slide. And, and back again to space. They really think today that uh, the ability to degrade or control uh, outer space, and particularly satellites in low Earth orbit, is extremely important. And what they don't understand completely is that the satellites that are in high Earth orbit, they just ran a test that just about would have been a high Earth orbit satellite kill. High Earth orbit is where we, we and the Soviet, the Russians, keep our satellite systems to observe missile launches. Those are our early warning satellites. You begin to wipe out satellites in low Earth orbit, mid orbit, you degrade communications, you degrade weather, things like that. You blind, you know, we had a tacit agreement with the Soviet Union that neither side would blind the other's launch detection satellites because that would be an indication of nuclear war. We don't have, they have, first of all, 
I've seen them write about that, but you don't really see a full discussion of that openly. And I don't know if they fully understand that, because they they don't have that system yet. When they get it, they'll understand it. Next slide. Uh, they do have sophisticated space warfare programs, and they've tested every one of these kinetic kill vehicles. They have dazzled or blinded for a short period of time uh, American electro-optical satellites. They've jammed satellites. They've launched micro-satellite constellations out of their uh, spacecraft. They do have ground-based millimeter wave. And just like us, what do we call it, the X-37, they're working on an upper atmospheric fighter that can fight up into space or down into the atmosphere. Next slide. Concepts that... Uh, well, I, I think the most important point on this slide is that for them, Deterrence requires the demonstration of a capability. You don't just announce you have something. You shoot a satellite out of the sky and show it, which is what they did with their own weather satellite, which is what they did with our uh, electro-optical satellite. You show what you can do. Next slide. Uh, and finally, cyber. Okay, what do they use it for? I mean, it, it really does all these things. You saw this week the, the J-31, uh, their new stealth fighter, got shown at the Juhai Air Show. Ten years ago, they stole most of the plans for an F-35 through a cyber attack. And it looks a lot like it. Uh, but the, the, the most important concept here is that... Um, their view of reconnaissance, whether it's space reconnaissance or cyber reconnaissance, is it, it's used to prepare for attack. I mean, we have a peacetime reconnaissance program, you know, peacetime naval and aerial, we would call it peacetime reconnaissance program. We want to use our systems to see what the enemy's got are doing without creating a conflict. They call that type of reconnaissance preparation for war, which is why they're so sensitive to ships and aircraft operating in their exclusive economic zone. Next slide. I, I put this up here because um, he, he, there's a big difference between espionage and cyber war. Everybody engages in espionage. We may be the only country that doesn't take the results of our espionage and turn it over to our private company. <laughs> the French do, the Brits do, the Israelis do, the Chinese certainly do. Uh, but um, when you begin to attack a nation's critical infrastructure to degrade the nation, it changes from espionage to an act of war. They understand that. Next slide. Uh, kind of useful because it shows the evolution of how these concepts got um, adopted by the People's Liberation Army. Go ahead and the next one. And then we're really done. Uh, I, I've got a couple of slides up here that, that simply, I really put them in for Walter to, to show that um, you, you really face a lot of intelligence groups in China. Go to the next one. <coughs> All right. And what's the next? Oh, no, just go back. Uh, but every one of these has sort of an innocuous name, like uh, they have a thing called the China Institute of International Strategic Studies 
that purports to be a civilian think tank. It's really the Military Intelligence Department of the PLA. They have uh, an organization uh, called the China Association for International Friendly Content. It will bring Americans to China or foreigners. It's really the General Political Department and International Liaison Department of the Communist Party. Go back a second. The China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, sounds like you know, any other think tank, is the um, eighth bureau of the Ministry of State Security. So that's in there to kind of say, you know, you, there, there's probably nobody in that country that works for the government that's just a plain private citizen. So I'm going to end it here if there are any questions. And you guys get to ask first if you have it. <coughs> Not, it's open or it's open. I just want to know what is the relationship between Russia and the Soviet military strategy or doctrine, the Chinese one, or the Chinese learning from the Russians, or the Russians from the Chinese? Or they feed I, I, I think the, it, it's fair to say that since the 30s, um, they have been students of Soviet doctrine, and they continue to depend on a lot of Russian military thinking and equipment. And how do you is that? Well, and now I don't see it going the other way. Yeah, but it seems like to me maybe it's just a I mean a false historical analogy on my part, but the Russians using these you know, quote-unquote separatists in eastern Ukraine, it sort of looks like a variation of the Chinese did in Korea, mainly, you know, oh, we're not officially at war with the U.S. These are just volunteers. Well, that's an interesting concept. I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, nor have I seen anything, not, I'm, I'm not a, a deep student of, of Russian strategic writing, but I haven't seen that reflected anywhere. But I agree with you. That, that using people's volunteers. I, I mean, I think they just put different uniforms on them, just like the Chinese did in Korea. I think you're absolutely right. But it's hard to say that that's what's stimulating. It, it, I, I will say that it's, it, it's what Putin was exposed to, and it was Soviet doctrine in Western Germany during the Cold War. And they did that. You know, they didn't have people in and out. Yes. Do they have an analogy to our deliberate planning process? Uh, do they have existing contingency plans for various areas? They absolutely do. They, they have uh, contingency planning processes. They run annual meetings. They war game them. Um, and uh, you, you can sort of see them reflected in war games. And, and you'll, uh, what I will see is operations officers from military regions and group armies getting together to review plans. Yes? Can you comment a little bit on the on Jian Zemin uh, peaceful rise theory? Do you think we can give him the, the Nobel Peace Prize every time? <laughs> no, no I, I mean, I thought it was a, um, a very clever and effective diplomatic uh, initiative that certainly was accompanied by a good foreign policy initiative in Southeast Asia that helped put many of the Southeast Asians at ease that was completely undone by China's aggressive actions around the South China Sea. Now, conversely, does that prove Paul Kennedy wrong? Or maybe... Oh, I, I, you know, I think you got to give it time to see if Kennedy's wrong or right because they haven't risen yet. Uh, I, I mean, Kennedy's thesis is necessarily there's going to be conflict, whether that conflict is a war or whether it's what we see now, kind of a, a you know, a, I mean, it's almost a cold war between us on one hand, or certainly a, a pretty strong competition. But I, I, I mean, I think Kennedy's thesis is a very good warning 
and it's one the Chinese reacted to. Yes. Uh, I was uh, trying to go about uh, posing a question, sort of going backwards. But if you assume, if, if as uh, we agree, uh, the, the Chinese uh, place a uh, big emphasis on deception, and I've read the book Thirty Six Strategies, fantastic book, and so forth and so on. Uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that? somewhere along the line, they are misleading us about what their true intentions are, and then to ask where could it possibly be, observing their actual actions, that they're doing something that is potentially misleading us and distracting us from what we would rationally think their real intentions are. You, you, you know, I, I was an intelligence way? collector. I made, I mean, I'll just talk about one really good document I got my hands on. It was a top secret document. Uh, from the party center, and, and it, it essentially laid out three levels of message or communication. What it said was, on uh, our international aims and programs for the general public and for foreign consumption, this is what we're going to say. And, and this was designed for high-level party people. And, the broad level of the Communist Party, this is what we're telling average party members. For us in the party center, here's the real deal. We're going to do A, B, and C. They've always communicated that way inside the party. But I don't know that that's, you know, strange or different. You know, I mean, if you look at our published national military strategy, that's a big difference from our war plans. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know that that's different for any country. I don't think that's unique to China. Yes? Uh, Chinese view of North Korea. I mean, uh, is North Korea a necessary evil? Is it, uh, is it useful in some way, or is it like a pimple on their board? No, it's absolutely useful in a couple of ways. It keeps the Chinese um, at the center of U.S. Uh, foreign policy thinking. Uh, it keeps that... Um, buffer between U.S. forces and South Korean forces in China, and it keeps a, a good buffer. I mean, they're still worried about Japan. They're very serious about Japan. They do not trust the Japanese. So they're unhappy with many of North Korea's actions, but they're able to use them to great advantage. Uh, Jonathan Cosgrove, also a student in the late general's class. Uh, you mentioned several times that in China's strategic thinking that the U.S. and Japan are the primary enemies that they they have in their, the front of their mind in strategic planning. But there's also a lot of writing, uh, particularly in uh, geopolitical thought, that there will eventually be rising uh, tensions and even some level of conflict between China and Russia, which you... Um, you said that that's not going on right now. Do you see any sort of, what would be the source of that tension or a catalyst for that tension if it were to work? Well, I don't think either side really trusts the other. Um, I, I think if there was a, a major buildup in the Russian Far East, which I don't think the Russians are capable of right now, uh, if there was a change in the balance of the way both China and Russia use the uh, Central Asian Republics and the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, you can see a shift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I think I'm going to call it a night. Oh, all right, you go ahead. You're <laughs> yeah, I'm going to spend, I moved to Swiss Embassy, intern with Eric and Um I was so you said during the lecture before that China and the U.S. people there were never trusting each other. And also, there was never trust between Russia and China. So, but on the other hand, with, when it came to not proliferation, the Russians and the U.S. people they they had kind of trust agreement. So, in the long term, will it be possible that the Americans and the Russians would come closer together again? The Americans and the Russians? Well, I I, I think what happened was. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the military liaison missions that existed in 
Potsdam and uh, in, in West Germany. You know, we we kept military people in Potsdam. The Russians and East Germans kept military people in West Germany. We were allowed to inspect facilities. We should sort of had rules of operations and understandings. You would do this. You won't do that. Uh, we had so many rounds of arms control and arms limitation talks that that generally we understood what each other's red lines were. And, and I think we sort of still do. Uh, we were never allies, you know. I, I think well, Hillary Clinton's reset was, you know, that bullshit was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I think that um, what Putin's doing today would, would probably convince the Ameri average American strategic thinker to say, that Russia has visions of recreating itself you know, as a great power with influence on the European continent. Uh, and, and that's going to cause the Americans to have a certain level of mistrust, and the Chinese. So I don't think it's ever going to be an alliance. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it.